Well, my name is John Veach. I'm Managing Director of Talgo UK. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to share with you some of the history and achievements of Talgo and indeed our future plans for Longanit in Fife and the opportunity to work with us in the future as suppliers, partners and the community. Insofar as Talgo, it's a real privilege to work for them. Established in 1942, it is a family run company and our chairman and president is actually the grandson of one of the original founders. And they brought about technological change with trains and the dynamics of trains at that time and really challenged the thinking of how trains were developed and designed. It was always around heavy trains, safety of trains and the speed of trains. But indeed, the founders thought differently. How can we look at different ways of reducing the weight of trains, increasing the speed of trains and the flexibility of trains? And they came about with a number of novel ideas, which are absolutely core to our business and innovation flows right through to this day. Our company is extremely diverse. We have nationalities of over 28 countries and we have an industrial presence in 44 countries across the world. We operate very high speed trains, not just in Spain, but indeed Saudi Arabia, across Russia, America, and we've secured recent contracts which enable trains to go cross-border, across international borders, from Germany into Netherlands and Austria, and indeed from Denmark into Germany. Our technological principles look at lightweightness. So we have aluminium construction trains. We have shorter coaches, which actually provides greater flexibility and capacity. We have the ability to change gauge on the move, which is extremely important when you're going across continents or international countries. And we are also very proud of the fact that we have independent wheels. So we don't have fixed axles and that enables greater speeds to be taken and be track friendly to infrastructure providers. One of the proudest parts though is the step free access from platform to train and within the train itself. We want people to be part of this success. The rest of the world is growing we continue to see phenomenal growth, particularly in Asia Pacific, where people are still wanting to travel by train. And Talgo sees this as a real opportunity. We have two factories in Spain, one in northern Spain and one near Madrid, with our headquarters. And the establishment of a third factory in Longanit in Fife will actually triple the size of the company. And it's a real privilege to lead this opportunity into the UK. The opportunity from Long again is not just a service within the UK, but the ability to export to the rest of the world. And how iconic would that be, bringing true manufacturing back to the birthplace of railways in the UK? So our plans at Long Gannett see a factory of around uh, 100,000 square meters. Um, today, we're delighted to engage with people who can support us in the construction of that. This factory will look after 1,000 direct workers and 5,000 indirect workers. And it ranges from a support network of medical staff to security staff to supporting the true production facility. We want our factory at Longanit to be truly iconic, to reflect the significance of the location. It if you're flying, will be the first or the last thing you may see flying in and out of Edinburgh and indeed Glasgow on a good day. And indeed by road, by rail and by sea. And indeed, people of the Central Belt can see, even today, the original chimney stack. So we are engaged with some significant people that can actually bring a beautiful building that everybody can be so proud of here at Long Gannett. Our plans for the UK are not just at Long Gannett. We have an all Britain strategy, which involves a research and innovation centre in Chesterfield, which will be a perfect hub. 
where people can work securely and safely with our people from innovation and our company, continually learning and improving our experience, working in laboratories, looking at new technologies and new futures. Hydrogen is a huge drive for everybody at the moment, and how you can reduce weight is another factor. And again, uh, working with colleges, universities, and suppliers who are very versatile and knowledgeable with our experience from across the world can only be a win-win situation. So coming back to Longanit and today, we'll obviously share with you our formal processes on how you can engage with us. We received phenomenal support even last week in Chesterfield where we hosted a supplier event where over 200 companies and potential partners joined us and looked to work with us. And here today, delighted to hear what the local community can support us with and suppliers, particularly around the construction of the factory. As I say, this is going to be a beautiful factory for people to be so proud of in the future. So hopefully that has just given you a little insight into the achievements of Talgo and our plans for the future. It's so exciting, so, so exciting. And we actively encourage you all to come and work with us and talk with us. There'll be an opportunity later on for question and answers. And indeed, we can share with you on a one-to-one -one basis, if time allows, how you can actually properly engage with us, sharing your capabilities. But what a phenomenal experience. And thank you very much. Hi there, uh, my name is David Sweeney. I'm the development manager on NNG, uh, the Nartnagria Offshore Wind Project. And I work for EDF Renewables and I'm uh, doing a presentation here for Five Council Meet the Buyer event. A uh, quickly brief overview of EDF Renewables. Uh, EDF Renewables UK and Ireland, um, a leading renewable energy company and with our colleagues at EDF Energy, we're the largest low carbon generator in the UK. Uh, we develop, build and operate and maintain wind farms onshore and offshore. And we have a number of battery projects and solar projects across the UK and Ireland. We have a partner within um, NNG and delighted that ESB, um, Ireland's leading energy company, joined us in 2019 to help uh, construct and operate the, the wind farm. Um, as I said, they're, they're a leading energy company in Ireland and they're uh, growing their presence in, in, the, in the UK and have started an office in Glasgow in 2017. A quick overview of the project for those who are new to offshore wind. Uh, the NNG project, uh, you know, it says construction started in 2019, but the project process started in 2008, and I'll come to that a little bit uh, later. Uh, the Narnagria project uh, due to be fully commissioned by 2023, and it's 15 and a half kilometers off the coast of Fife at Fife Ness. It's 105 square kilometers, um, and the turbines will be distributed uh, across that area. EDF Renewables UK and Ireland bought the project in May 2018 uh, through a, a competitive bidding process. The energy site was originally uh, chosen because it combines a technical, economic, and environmental deliverability. So we looked at certain criteria and make sure that they were all viable for the project, water depth, ground condition, expected energy yield, access to port facilities, impact on uh, environmental um, aspects. Um, after we first had achieved consent in 2014, uh, we went, then went on to win a contract for difference in the first round of the CFD auctions in 2015, and that provided us the springboard to move on with the project and be able to generate for a period of 15 years with that, the CFD and a further 10 years without. Some of the key figures, there'll be 54 turbines, it's a 450 megawatt uh, project. Um, just to give you an idea, the height, the size of the turbines is going to be 208 meters above sea level. The water depth, uh, it is it tends to be quite deep in Scotland, so 45 to 55 meters. And that really all adds up to being able to power more than 375,000 homes, which is equivalent to more, uh, more homes than the city of Edinburgh. I'd like to give you an, an idea of what we're actually building offshore, and then I'll come to the contractors who are doing the building for us. Um, 
So there, we, we split the project into two. So there we've got generation assets and we've got offshore transmission assets. So the generation assets are the turbines. They are installed onto the, the foundations and they're all linked to the substations by interarray cables. And there's one additional cable that connects the two substations and that is actually part of the generation assets. What we've got is the transmission assets is the two substations and their uh, foundations the export cables that will take the power back um, to the East Lothian coast at Thornton Lock Beach, which is just next to uh, Torness Nuclear Power Station. And then there's an onshore cable that will take that up to 12 and a half kilometers up to the grid connection point, which is inside the Crystal Rig wind farm up in the Lammermuir Hills. And they're all called the transmission assets. And what will happen a few, in a few years is that we will sell on those assets to what we call an off tool, which is an offshore transmission owner. So they, we're in, in Europe and in, in the UK, the, legally you're not allowed to generate and transmit um, power. So that's why we have to um, sell off the, the off tool assets. So that'll be a separate company once we get into the O&M phase. The layout, uh, a very uh, quick schematic of where the turbines are going to be. Um, uh, the interarray cabling, the layouts have been changed, um, but I just wanted to highlight where the turbines are, where you can see the substations and the export cable corridor. So that's where the export cables will come out of the wind farm and will head south towards the East Lothian coastline. Brief overview or brief map of the onshore, and you can see where Thornton Log Beach is there. And that's where Torness Power Station is. And the cable comes across the A1, across the East, East Coast Main Line, and up uh, into the Lammermuir Hills and connects into uh, a grid connection point at, uh, at Crystal Rig Wind Farm. A bit more detailed um, timeline uh, for the project, just to highlight how long uh, an offshore wind farm can take. Um, the process initially started in, in 2008, in 2009 with um, site selection work and exclusivity awarded by Crown Estate, uh, who are now Crown Estate Scotland, uh, devolved to, to uh, Scotland. I joined the project in 2010, just as the grid connection was being signed. And through um, the next few years, really concentrating on um, land uh, um, aspects of the project, offshore land aspects of the project as well. Um, and all the consenting work. Um, we finally got our offshore consent in 2014, as I mentioned before. And unfortunately, we had a, a bumpy couple of years after that where a judicial review was uh, initiated against the Scottish government uh, for its decision to consent us and another three projects in the fourth and Tay region. Um, in 2017, at the end of 2017, we, were, um, we, we finally got to a point where the the judicial review proceedings concluded in favour of the Scottish Government and we can move forward with um, building the project. And that's when EDF Renewables came into the, the picture in 2018 and bought the project uh, in May. Um, and I was lucky enough with a couple of my colleagues to come across with the project and join EDF. Um, over the next uh, 15 months, we were able to reach financial close and bring in, uh, and delighted to bring in our partners ESB in, in November of 2019 to construct and operate the, uh, the wind farm. And as you can see, um, we're in 2020. It's been a, for us, it, it's been an um, unusual year. Um, it's been difficult working conditions with, um, everything going on at the moment, but we it's quite exciting, obviously, to see that we've got onshore construction and now offshore construction started. So we're delighted to see that. Now, next year is, is probably going to be the one of the busiest we'll have on the project and a lot of the foundation work and all our electrical work will be uh, installed during the year. And that lead us to 22-23, where the wind turbines will be installed. And the wind farm will be fully commissioned and handed over to our operation and maintenance uh, team um, in uh, 23. I just want to go through and, and highlight some of the people or some of the organizations that will be the contractors essentially in building the project. Now EDF Renewables, we're, um, we're the 
doing the construction management services. So we are leading on on the construction management and operation of, of the project. Um, we have a connection agreement with National Grid, so that allows us obviously to export power to uh, National Grid. And we come into our tier one contractors. A turbine supply is from Siemens Gamesa, and they'll supply 54 turbines. And that will include um, pre-assembly work at uh, the port of Dundee, and then installation and commissioning work, and moving on, um, importantly as well, to O&M, where they'll provide uh, the O&M for the first part of, of the, the, um, our O&M phase. SIPEM are our foundation contractors and they design, fabricate, supply and install the jackets um, and the foundations. They will also install the uh, offshore substation foundations and they'll also transport and install the top sites. And uh, I've got a picture of those later to give you an idea of, of what they are. Fred Olson Wind Carrier provide our vessel for installing the turbines. Um, GE and HSM. Um, are collaborating together to bring the substations, and that's the onshore substation, where it's GE, and GE and HSM delivering the offshore substation. The export cables connecting uh, the substations are, are provided by Prismian, and they'll install that, those as well, so the offshore and the onshore. And the interarray cables, which connect the wind turbines to the substations offshore, are supplied by Demi Tideway. A bit of the scope of uh, Siemens Gamesa, so uh, they will be coming in 2022 to do all the pre-assembly work at Port Dundee. And then the second half of that year will be the installation and commissioning and running it through into 23 for complete handover of all the, the turbines once fully commissioned. Um, fourth ports uh, mentioned there, that's where the, the marshalling of the turbines. So Siemens Gamesa will be there in 2022. Fourth ports have invested heavily already in, in their uh, facilities in Port of Dundee to, to help with the, um, the construction of NNG. So 10 million pounds was, um, was spent upgrading the Quayside in 2017. And winning the contract for NNG was instrumental in a further 40 million pounds worth of investment in the port. And that's really helping at the moment, um, just seeing drone footage yesterday um, they are they've, they're completely clearing an area of the port of Dundee ready for Siemens, and that really will provide a legacy for uh, future projects to come into Dundee. So really looking forward to seeing a lot of work out of of Dundee in uh, in the future. The Federal and Wind Carrier is a jack up. Um, they will be installing the the turbines, um, and that's a few of the, um, the technical criteria of the of the the jack up just to give you an idea of of what it is and um, it can jack up to almost uh, 60 65 meters to allow for the water depth and that brings the platform out of the water and gives a, a stable platform to crane the turbines into position now this is the sipem s7000 it's a, a huge vessel uh, i think it's the third largest crane vessel in the world and that's just a picture of it installing the turbines for the high wind project. And for those of you living by the coastline in Fife, you'll probably be able to see it. Um, it's currently out there um, drilling the sockets uh, offshore for the piles, which will uh, we, we will then put the jackets on top of the piles to, um, to provide the foundation for the turbines. Um, it's, it's 200 meters long, it is an absolute monster of a vessel and again delighted to see it um, arriving on NNG earlier this year and continuing to work there. Just to give you an idea of the drill that's been used, that's a three meter diameter drill um, and it's 60 meters long in the left hand picture there. So it is a, again the, the some of the technology that's been used in this project and uh, novel technology and huge um, infrastructure that's been used Give you an idea of the foundation is there are 54 wind turbine uh, foundations they're all three-legged and the uh, the offshore substation will be three-legged as well the interior cables uh, they'll be installed by demi tideway and they'll use their vessel the living stone which is um, pictured there now the NNG substations as i said will be supplied by ge and ghsm 
is there a 3D schematic of what the onshore work substation will be like? And INH Brown um, were awarded the civil contracts on that, and they're currently on site working away. And HSM are building it, uh, the, the substation um, in their uh, premises. And there's a couple of photographs of where we are at the moment. So that's the, the steel work has gone up for, um, for the control building at our onshore substation. And on the right hand side there is the substation, offshore substation currently sitting in HSM's yard. The onshore cable pro progress at the moment. So as, as I said, I've got 12 and a half kilometers of cable going from Thornton-Law Beach to Crystal Rigowin Farm in the Lammermuir Hills. And we're currently uh, digging the trenches to lay the ducting. And then at a later date, we'll bring the sections of onshore cable and we'll pull those through the, the ducts. And the cable is, um, uh, manufacturers have been completed and they're sitting in storage waiting for shipment to the UK. What else we're doing as well is um, because if, if anyone is traveling down or up the A1, um, then you'll see a lot of work uh, happening just at Tornets. This drilling rig is part of the work that's going on at the beach, which is uh, to do a horizontal directional drill. And that will allow us to bring our export cable in onshore and connect our onshore cable just behind the beach. Um, that drill is likely to be six to 700 meters long um, and it avoids us having to dig a trench through uh, the beach and the near shore. And in the coming months, we're going to be doing uh, other HDD work underneath the A1 and the East Coast main line. So when you're going down the A1, you'll see a lot of drilling rigs, a lot of work happening in the next few months. Another aspect, an important aspect of the project is the O&M. And now the O&M operation and maintenance of the, the wind farm will continue for 25 years. And that, uh, we're delighted to say, we Eyemouth Harbour is our preferred location for the operation and maintenance base. And recently we, were, we managed to um, attain planning uh, in conjunction with Eyemouth Harbour for our O&M building, which will be uh, right at the entrance of the harbour. And as you can see, um, I'm pretty happy with that building. It, it, it will look stunning at the at the mouth of um, the river there. So, 25 years, and that's where we'll have our office, our warehousing, and our CTVs, our, our crew transfer vessels will be um, will be based at Eyemouth. Um, so, a lot of work for 25 years there is is is, is going to be a, a great benefit to that area. Now, procurement is ongoing with that. Um, we're currently looking to for tenders for the construction of the building. And there's also some pontoons that will be going in to, um, to allow the berthing of the, of the CTVs. Now, um, there'll be a lot of engagement uh, locally from our O&M team, given the length of time that we're going to be based there. And I'd urge you to look out for any notices about um, specific O&M um, events from NNG. Now, supply chain engagement is not a one-off. We use multiple events to, to try and get the word out there, to, to, to get the opportunities available to everyone. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of key aspects of the Scottish industry. Now, the Scottish industry came together and we've, they've developed two clusters uh, in Scotland. The Forth and Tay Offshore Cluster, which is quite obvious, is based for the Forth and Tay. Um, and it's more um, surrounding the, the likes of Nar Naguia, Inch Cape, Sea Green, and the SSE developments. And Deep Wind, which is targeting the north of Scotland or the Murray Firth and the existing wind farm and wind farm construction up there. And both looking at the future um, prospects in Scotland. Now they collaborate, those clusters collaborate and compete um, a nice healthy competition between, between the clusters and really both engaged and trying to deliver supply chain development for Scotland um, and really focus the minds of the supply chain and, and enhance it as, as much as possible. Now we, uh, as NNG, we've had two Meet the Buyer series of events, 2015, and uh, more recently, uh, earlier this year, in, in a different time, back in early March. Um, and there's a, a picture of some of the of a, everyone who attended the, the the event in Fife. 
Um, we had over 500 companies signed up over four workshops in March, and both the clusters were helping to deliver uh, those events. And we had one in East Lothian, one in uh, Fife, uh, one in Dundee, and one in Aberdeen. Um, and over those uh, days, those four consecutive days, uh, our contractors, including uh, and ourselves, presented um, detailed scope of work um, to provide the supply chain an insight into uh, how they could get involved in the construction of NNG. Uh, Prismian, unfortunately, couldn't join because of the restrictions at the time. Um, it did seem like a it's it's a different time altogether. Um, back in March, wasn't it? Um, we had a share fair concept in the afternoons. We invited offshore wind organisations in Scotland to come along and and engage with our supply chain and to illustrate and highlight how they could help. And that's the catapult as well as the clusters um, and others across um, across Scotland. And then we facilitated one to one meetings with our tier one. So we managed to get around about two hundred and twenty companies speaking directly with the contractors. And hopefully a number of um, uh, opportunities were um, were highlighted and a number of contracts were awarded over the over the year. COVID-19, uh, I mean, we couldn't get through a presentation without mentioning it, and I think I have mentioned that a couple of times, but it has curtailed our ability to, to engage properly and it, it delighted that we have events like this to really help us um, engage as best we can with the supply chain without the ability of face-to-face -face meetings. What we want to achieve on NNG is really stimulating local benefit where we can um, and where it's practical to do so. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of successes. We've got Fourth Ports, Eyemouth and INH Brown. Um, and they've, you know, they're, they're some of the big um, successes so far on the project. But there's a couple of small uh, companies that um, don't usually get um, mentioned in, in aspects like this. And we've done a series of sort of social media releases just to highlight the small com companies that are really benefiting from, from NNG and the offshore wind um, uh, the offshore wind industry in Scotland together. So it's not just about the tier ones. It's not just about Fourth Ports, Eyemouth, INH Brown and others. It's really about everyone else down the chain employing and developing in Scotland and really enhancing the supply chain offering in Scotland. And again, I mentioned the tier ones before, but that gives you a good idea of how long they're all going to be working on the project and what they're working on. Uh, there's a couple of contacts there, and, and the last slide I'll leave up as well has the contacts for uh, NNG and EDF. But there's the email address for myself and my colleague, Alan Duncan, who's our supply chain engagement lead. Please get in contact with us and um, ask us anything and we'll try to answer or redirect as best we can. Now, I've talked a lot about NNG there. I just wanted to talk briefly about EDF and some of the developments the EDF have. Now, we've got a number of offices around the UK. Um, I'm based at the Edinburgh office. Well, I'm based at the home office at the moment, but um, my usual base is in Edinburgh, and that's where a lot of the renewables work um, uh, goes through in Scotland. Um, and the NNG project is one floor down from the ADF office in Edinburgh. We have a number of off onshore sites, a number of uh, offshore sites. So Northern Greer is in construction and we've got Blythe and uh, Teesside and we've got Codling on, in, in development as well. And we're we're starting to add a lot more of, you know, battery storage and, and the, the solar uh, projects on, into the portfolio as well. And we've done a number of acquisitions in, in Ireland so EDF Renewables UK and Ireland now um, is really in a, in Ireland is a huge important part of of the of the mix. Um, I haven't been able to add those to the, that map as well, but I ask if anyone's interested in supply chain in Ireland to get in touch as well. I mentioned two projects that were EDF have constructed. So they've got the Blythe Offshore Demonstrator, which was technically advanced on the on the basis that the gravity based foundations were used, and the turbines at the time were the biggest that had ever been used. Teesside um, was officially opened in 2014, and it really gave a base for EDF to, to start looking at offshore. 
I mentioned Codling. Uh, we acquired um, 50% of Codling earlier this year as a joint venture with Fred Olson. And that really is gathering pace and the team in uh, working in Codling are doing a huge amount of work um, to, to push that project on. And again, if anyone's interested in supply chain uh, in Ireland, then I'm happy to redirect uh, onto the team there. And just to give an idea, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, but there are two leasing rounds um, coming up. The Scotland um, round, which is probably of more interest to, to yourselves, which is Crown Estate Scotland or running uh, Scotland. Um, and that there are a number of sites that are being bid for by a number of uh, developers of highly competitive uh, process. And we'll find out um, next year who the successful developers are on that. Um, so hopefully EDF Renewables, um, but if not, then certainly uh, there's a number of organizations out there that will be needing a lot of help to develop their projects. And the Crown Estate are running um, a, a separate round in, in a, um, England and Wales, and that's uh, round four they're calling that. And again, EDF uh, Renewables are really pressing ahead with with that one and, and we progressed through pre-qualification earlier this year. Well, thank you for listening. A uh, brief overview of Nardegria and uh, of an even more briefer view of EDF. At least some of the, um, if you're interested in NG or indeed of EDF, then please get in contact. And there's a couple of the website uh, links there as well. So thanks for your time. And I'll speak again at the, the Q&A. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for attending the first Q&A live session. I'm Dot Smith. I am from Fife Council Economic Development Team. So today I would like to introduce Thomas from Fife Council Economic Development Team. We've got David Sweeney from EDF. We've got John Veach from Talbo. And we've got Sarah and Derek Hamilton from Fife Council Procurement Team. So if there's any questions, I'm not seeing any as yet, so there may be some technical glitches from my side. Um, so if there is, Sarah will step in um, to assist with the questions. So if, if you are answering or asking any questions, please continue to do so, and we will pick them up as best we can. Now, there is, I've, I've mentioned a poll, so the poll is part of this live chat, so please do answer if you can. We will be answering questions. Those that we don't get to, we will pick up and they will be exported after the event. So we might not get to them all, but those that we don't, we will make sure that there is a response. So make sure you put your full name into the question as well, please, just so we can pick it up and cross the fair. This is certainly a first for, for us in Fife for a virtual meet the buyer. I do prefer to, to meet in face to face circumstances. So hopefully next year. So how have you, how has the panel found it today? Anne, how how's the virtual experience for you? All well? Yeah, it's good. It's the first time I've done this sort of thing. So, yeah, quite excited to, to try. It's great to have this technology. If COVID was 10 years ago, I'm not sure what we would have all done, to be honest. Absolutely. Now, just a reminder to people that have to in the chat, if you do want to ask any questions, there is a chat function at the, the right-hand side of the screen. So please do pop anything in and answer any questions. We've had a comment saying thank you um, to John in relation to Talgo. So I think that's certainly a, a topic that, that there was a number of people looking forward to hearing as well as also the offshore wind opportunities. So I think, John, there may, well, there may well be requests for a chat about Talgo. If there are any questions out with this, Mm -hmm. 
chat session, the virtual speak sure you take advantage of that. Well, I think the creatures are coming in and I don't seem to have access to say that to, to yourself, just to run through if possible. Yes, yes, of course. Um, so one question that's come in is from uh, Jennifer Payne asking about how do we make it easier for SMAs to bid for subcontracting opportunities? Where are they listed? So can I direct that to you, Derek, in the first instance, please? Yep, no problem. Uh, any uh, major projects that are tendered by Fife Council are tendered on Fife, on Public Contracts Scotland, and more importantly, this will be published on Public Contracts Scotland. And it's in that, that portal that you can uh, find out details of recently awarded contracts that are, have been awarded, if that's a, a way that you want to try and find out about subcontracting opportunities. I would also say that Supplier Development Programme run excellent courses on how to engage with Public Contracts Scotland. And they give you lots of good hints and tips on how to interrogate Public Contracts Scotland and use the Public Contracts Scotland to engage with primary contractors about uh, upcoming or live procurements. Okay. Hi, well, does, does that thank you. help answer the question? If that hasn't answered your question, Jennifer, please do feel free to pop in another question and we'll, we'll pick that one up. But as Derek says, there are um, there is a section on Public Contracts Scotland where subcontracting opportunities for large projects are specifically advertised. Okay, thank you, Derek. Now, um, I have a message um, for John at, Tal, at Talgo. Now, um, I'm not sure if this is one that you'll be able to pick up just now, John. Um, there's a question saying, will you be tendering for any M&D consulting? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, potentially, we're looking at a whole spectrum and range of people that can work with us. So any interest from uh, people, please email us at talgo.uk at talgo.com and then we can pick up the specifics thereafter. Or indeed, later on in hopefully the uh, uh, sessions that we can try and uh, enable meeting people today. Thank you, John. Um, another one for you, John, while we've uh, got you at the mic. Um, will you need help in land remediation at the Long Gannett site? Um, for the site specifically, quite potentially. Um, we've got a commitment from Scottish Enterprise um, to obviously look at platforming the area that we need, um, but then there's greater plans for Long Gannett. So again, um, let's engage later today. Thank you, John. All right, let's find the next one. Um, there is another request from a Chrissy Southgate to chat further with you, John, but I think that's more of something that um, Chrissy would like to pick up offline. Um, I think there are instructions about how to make those connections, so hopefully that we'll be able to follow that one up. Um, question here for David. Are there any requirements for subsea array cable fault monitoring solutions, either from EDFR or any of your partners? Yeah, currently on NNG, the inter-array work is getting carried out by Tideway Demi. Um, they've got the full scope and any sort of um, work and during installation and commissioning will be from them. Uh, moving through to the O&M phase, then you know, uh, there may be requirements uh, in the future. So I would encourage if you've got any uh, interest in that one, just to get in contact, go past the, the exhibition stand or indeed, I think my contact details were on the, the presentation. So I'm more than happy to uh, ping that over to our own team. Thank you very much. Right, um, we've got one here. Um, I noticed there's a lot of opportunity for construction. For the speakers we've had so far, do you have an opportunity to discuss PPE 
tooling and more consumables, for example. I'm not sure would that be something either John or David could pick up on? Yeah, no, absolutely. Definitely need a need, need for that. Uh, and again, uh, we welcome approaches from all parts of uh, the sector. Yeah, it's, it's the same for us as well. I mean, just get in contact and um, we are using local companies for for PPE, etc. And that's for our onshore teams or offshore teams and the wider EDF renewables. So yeah, please get in contact again with the details that are on the, the presentation. Thank you very much. So I have one here. Um, Another one for John. Um, interested in being considered as a supplier to support the new production facility at Long Gannett, we supply world-leading CNC machines and innovative manufacturing technologies. How do I engage with Talgo to be considered as a supplier, and what are the timescales for this? Okay, so uh, we will provide that detail in the one-to-one -one sessions later, or indeed in direct contact. Um, but obviously we're putting everything in place to start manufacturing, delivering trains out of Long Gannett from spring 2024. Uh, there's a lead up obviously before that and the machines and the equipment. So again, please email us at talgo.uk, talgo.com or indeed meet with you later. Thank you. Now one for David. Um, we're an Irish company that provides water turbidity monitoring could you please advise on how to become part of the supply chain for Scotland and Ireland? Thank you. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, so obviously we have uh, ADF Renewables, our, uh, our UK and Ireland now with the acquisition of 50% of Codling. So yeah, again, it, I think it's the same the same answer for all of them is uh, to get in contact. The contact details are there for both NNG and for ADF, and I'm happy to uh, push that onto both procurement teams. Thank you. Um, just a reminder to everyone that we're just under 10 minutes left of the session now. So if you do have any questions, anything that's come up as a result of the conversations that we've had or any other questions left unanswered, please get them in now. Um, right, we've got one in that I know will be right up Derrick Street now. Um, will community benefits be included as a requirement as, of any part of tenders, contracts or bids? Now, I assume this is probably a question for Talgo and EDF really, but You've got Derek Hamilton here, who is our community benefits champion in Fife Council, so he'll be able to pick up on any um, any questions coming out of those answers as well. So I guess it's John and David. Will any community benefits be included as part of tenders or contracts coming up from your opportunities? Absolutely. Keith, for us, we want to capture the imagination of uh, generations to come to support us particularly local schooling. Uh, previously, we held a community event at Kincardine and we were absolutely thrilled with uh, uh, school children uh, and really just getting them to ask questions about how trains are made and how they can uh, contribute to their careers in the future. And that was uh, boys and girls and it was fantastic. Yeah, for, from our side, it, it, it's part of what we do. Um, there is the intention to have community benefit from Northern Aguia, um, and that will be uh, uh, coming out in the in the next few months. And what we're planning to do there, um, engagement is, uh, is is ongoing all the time, and looking at um, particularly Eyemouth, where our O and M base is. You know, there's a recruitment for apprentices there and and for technicians for going into uh, going to the turbines and um, so yeah edf it's you know for, for many many of our projects and community benefits part of it i would say it's not a, a legal requirement but it's certainly something that edf um uh, champion thank you derek do you want to pick that up from a five council wider procurement point of view Yes, not not a problem. Uh, Fife Council uh, includes community benefits where appropriate in all regulated procurements. A decision made at the point on we're carrying out a, a strategy uh, for the upcoming procurement exercise and a decision is made as to whether at that point that it's appropriate to include community benefits and also whether those community benefits will be scored or non-scored. Uh, we're very much a champion of community benefits and that now fits in with the community wealth building uh, policies that have been developed throughout Scotland. So community benefits are very, very much something that Fife Council 
uh, embeds within the majority of contracts where it's deemed appropriate. If anybody wants to talk about community benefits with myself, I'm always available for a chat about community benefits. And we do have some information on the five um, doing business with us website as well, I think, about community benefits, a leaflet that Derek's produced. And dot. And dot. Apologies, dot. Um, right. Um, this is one that came in a little while ago, so apologies for my delay in getting to it. Are there any big digital projects coming soon? This question goes to all of the companies represented, represented and possibly, I'm assuming that includes Five Council as well. So, David, any digital projects you're aware of? Um, to be fair, yeah, define that a little bit more. I know EDF Renewables is <laughs> deploying renewable projects, but ultimately, um, within that, there are digital uh, aspects to it, but uh, I probably that probably means something else to someone. Well, to if they could maybe, um, if that person could maybe um, supplement their question, we could maybe pick that up. But with regard to Fife Council, um, the category manager that you would need to speak to would be Lee Parry, and we can provide you with the contract uh, contact details for him. But also, and it's been mentioned before, any um, public sector opportunities will be advertised on the Public Contract Scotland website. So please do register your interest on there and make sure you're signed up to alert notifications for the opportunities that would interest you across the public sector in Scotland. John, do you have anything to add to that one? Well, indeed, uh, production processes very much controlled digitally and indeed trains are digitally hungry, data hungry particularly for uh, predictive maintenance and condition monitoring. So again, depending on the aspect of the question, it would be interesting to hear that. Okay, so we can maybe follow those up later. So we're just down to a couple of minutes left. I've quite a few questions here. Many of them are for John at Talgo. So we I will pick those up with John separately and ask, um, I'll, I'll forward all of those on to John if we can't get through to, through to answering them now while the session is still live. Um, we've got one here about forthcoming five council digital projects, which I hopefully just answered in the previous, um, when we were talking about the previous question. And so it's Public Contracts Scotland and Lee Parry. So we'll, we'll, look in, uh, we'll follow that one up with making sure we provide these details to you. Um, here we've got one about the impact, of the acknowledging the impact the pandemic has had on existing SME business across the UK. How will panel members ensure there is access to those organisations that are new to the industry, having started up in 2020, and do not have, for example, two to three years of accounts to prove financial standing? We might have to pick that one. We literally have one minute left, and I would just like to thank everybody for their engagement and the questions, and apologies, I do have some technical issues at this side. Um, but thank you very much, the panellists. Really appreciate your input today and especially at the, the kind of live Q&A slot. But as I've said, we will pick up questions that haven't been answered um, after the, the event. So please, no names are on the questions. Thank you very much, everybody.